And today in our series, The Life of Christ, I'm super excited because I have my friend, George Davis, all the way from Jacksonville, Florida. He's an amazing pastor, has six campuses, six different locations, and he and his wife planted this church back in 1996, during the 1900s, everybody. But he is an incredible communicator. He's an author. He is a singer. He's a preacher. And he's our dear friend. And I want you to get your notes out, get your pens ready, get your Bibles out, and get ready to welcome him, Pastor George Davis, everybody. Fellowship Church. Anybody excited about Jesus in this place? Come on, anybody excited about Jesus in this place? Man, it is an honor to be here with you. I had the privilege of being, uh, you can be seated, had the privilege of being here last night with a, a, a group of uh, staff and a bunch of folks online as well, but it's, it's good to be in the house with some people. Come on, say amen, somebody. I mean, these last seven months have been challenging for all of us, and just to be able to start the process of getting back into the flow of some sense of normalcy is great. So good to have all of you out. Can we just take a moment to just appreciate the best pastors on the entire West Coast of the United States? Come on, Pastor Sean and Diana Nepstead. We love them so much and appreciate them. You know, our church in Jacksonville, we are known for being hospitable. I mean, we, we kind of pride ourselves on being hosp hospitable. When people come to town, we take good care of them. I got here yesterday, and I felt like we got to step our game up. Because your pastors have treated me like the king of Zamundo or somebody, man. <laughs> I mean, just the gifts and the hospitality and the staff have been amazing. I'm glad to be here. I pastor a church in Jacksonville, Florida called Impact Church. We started in 1996 as Faith Christian Center and about six years ago changed the name to Impact Church. Uh, so it's a privilege to, to be the pastor there. We have a number of campuses throughout Florida and up the East Coast that have also uh, been churches that we have planted. And I'm blessed because I, I'm, I'm married. I have a beautiful wife, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, kidney of my kidney, gallbladder of my gallbladder. We've been married for 27 years to each other. Come on, somebody. And we have three children. I think they got a picture of my family they're going to put on the screen. That is my family. My wife, April, our, our daughter to the far left is the oldest. She's 19, a third-year student at Highlands College there in Alabama. Our 17-year-old son is right there next to her. And then our baby boy is in the middle. He is a 13-year-old, and they are the love of my life. It's an honor to be able to be the, the father and the, the, the husband of my family. Well, you're in this amazing series entitled The Life of Christ, and I just feel like I'm right here at the right time because part of what Christ taught about is something I want to spend a little time talking about today, and that is the power of choosing joy. The power of choosing joy. And I'm good friends with Sean and Diana, but I, I didn't even realize that one of the four values of your church is choose joy. I mean, we love God, we love people, we pursue excellence, and we choose joy around here. I didn't realize that until I got here last night, and I realized, though, why God has me going down this pathway. Can we just stop for a moment and say 2020 has been a real special year? I mean, that's putting it mildly, right? I mean, we've experienced a global pandemic we, 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 we have to walk now and we have to be concerned about who we're next to and who we're interacting with. We've had racial tensions that have just been at an all-time high. And can I just stop and tell you, to don't panic because everything we're experiencing right now, the Bible already told us it was coming. So none of this has caught God by surprise. I mean, we're, we're in a space right now where racial tensions are high. We got political unrest and things that are taking place. But we're in a space where I need you to understand that even though this year has been real special, God has still been good to us. You know, I saw this, I saw this meme on, on social media talking about 2020. He says, if 2020 was a math problem, it would probably go something like this. If you're going down the river in your canoe at two miles per hour and the wheel comes off of your canoe, how much pancake mix would you need to re-shingle your roof? That's about how much sense 2020 feels like it's making to us, right? But the truth of the matter is, watch this. God was already in 2020 before 2020 showed up. See, we were stuck in 2019 until, de until uh, December 31st at 1159 and 59 seconds. Then we got a chance to step over into 2020. But can I tell you, when we came to 2020, God was already here in 2020 waiting on us. Come on, which means January 1st of 2020, God was here. And December 31st of 2020, God will still be here. 
And part of what that should do for us is that it ought to produce a sense of peace in our hearts, but it should also produce a sense of joy on the inside. Which means no matter what's happening, no matter what's going on around us, God wants us to get to this place where we choose joy and not just as a theme or a value that we put on a wall or a coffee mug. He wants us to get up every single day and we choose joy today despite what's going on around us. And I need somebody to shout amen like you believe that. Now let me read to you from John chapter 15 verse 11. It says, these things I have spoken to you, Jesus is talking, so that my joy might remain in you. And so that your joy, watch this, may be full. Everybody shout full. Full. Everybody shout full. Full. Jesus said, I I told you the stuff I just said because I I want my joy to stay locked up on the inside of you. I don't want you to rely on just your your joy by itself. I want my joy to remain in you. He says, and I want your joy to be full. He didn't say kind of full, just about full. He said, I want your joy to be full. There's got to be a reason why Jesus wanted their joy and our joy to stay topped off at full. And I believe it's the same reason that Nehemiah gives us over Nehemiah when he says, the joy of the Lord is your what? Come on, the joy of the Lord is your what? I believe the reason why Jesus wants our joy to stay full is because if our joy is full, our strength will be full. And as Pastor Diana said, if we're going to endure, we're going to outlast the challenges that come our way. We've got to have some strength. We got to have some endurance. And one of the enemy's greatest tricks or weapons is not to attack our strength, but to attack our joy. Because it, even if we don't quite get it all the time, he understands if he can attack our joy, he's going to simultaneously diminish our strength. And I don't care how much courage we have, how much faith we have, how committed we are. If we don't have strength, we will not be able to outlast in the fight. So I want you to walk out of here today understanding no matter what you've dealt with in 2020, whether it's grief, whether it's been financial pressure, whether it's just been the pressure to keep things together in your family, whether you're a college student and you're trying to figure out, you know, how's my college year going to work out, whether you're one of our high school seniors who graduated this past year or this upcoming year, and your senior year looks nothing like you imagined it looking your entire life. I want you to walk out here understanding that if you're going to be everything God intended for you to be, and if you're going to see the conclusion of 2020 the way God intended, it's going to require us to grab on to some joy so we can grab on to some strength. Come on, somebody. And so we can outlast the tactics of this wicked enemy. In fact, listen to this quote. Every day we must make a decision to be spirit-led instead of circumstance-driven. Come on, that's good. Every day we get up, we've got to make a conscious decision to be spirit-led and not circumstance-driven. Well, now, why why do we say that? We say that because joy is different than happiness. Happiness is an emotion. You know, happiness is what happens when you go to the mailbox, come on, and you get a check in the mailbox for a few thousand dollars you weren't counting on. The IRS gives you a refund because you paid too many taxes four years ago and they were reconciling something. I mean, this is a made-up story because that just never happens. But if it did happen, come on, you go to the mailbox, you get a check you weren't counting on. That's happiness, man. The circumstance changed, and wow, I feel good about it. Happiness is when you go to the doctor, they think they might have seen something, and they tell you to come back in for another exam, and they look this time, and what they thought they saw, they don't see it this time. I mean, you don't have to try to work anything up. Happiness kicks in. Joy and happiness are not the same thing. Happiness is an emotion that is based on the circumstance. Joy is a part of the reborn, recreated human spirit. The day we get born again and accept Christ into our hearts, Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us. And the fruit, the the result of the Spirit, that's what the fruit of the Spirit is. The result of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us is we get not our love, we get God's love. We get God's joy and His peace and His long-suffering, etc. So joy comes to live in our hearts the day that we give Jesus Christ lordship over our lives. And what God wants us to learn how to do is in tough times, in difficult circumstances, learn how to tap into his supernatural joy instead of giving into the circumstance of the moment. Now let's look at at Psalm number 118 because David tells us something about this. In Psalm 118 verse 24, David said, this is the day the Lord has made. Then he says, he says, we will rejoice, watch this, and we will be glad in this day. I love that because David didn't say, I might rejoice, I might be glad, I I hope I rejoice, I hope I can be glad. He said, this is the day the Lord has made, I will rejoice. That's that's an early morning declaration, I will rejoice 
and I will be glad in this day. Now, when he says this is the day the Lord has made, he's not talking about the day like Sunday today. He's not talking about the day like Wednesday or Thanksgiving Day or Christmas Day. He's talking about the day, meaning the, 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 the time frame, the era. Like when we say back in the day, this used to happen. He's talking about a time frame or a time period. And if you understand the day he was talking about is the day we live in right now, then you'll understand we get up every single day and we have reason to rejoice even if it doesn't look like it. So, so what day is he talking about? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, Paul writes and he says, For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you. Somebody say, God hears me. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Somebody say, God helps me. Then he says, behold, now is that accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. What Paul is really teaching us this lesson right here, this is the day and the time we're living in right now where God is actually hearing us and helping us. He said, there's coming a day. There's a day where in an acceptable time, God says, I'm going to hear you. And in that day of salvation, I'm going to show up to help you. This is that day. This is the day, the era, the period of salvation. We call it in theological terms the dispensation of grace. The time when Jesus Christ has been risen from the dead, Holy Spirit has been given to us. We now accept Christ into our hearts. We're living in the day of salvation. We're living in the season of the dispensation of the grace of God. And because of that, we have reason every day we get up to be excited and to shout and thank God. Because we get a chance to live in a time that the prophets in the Old Testament wish they had seen. You say they, they, they wish they had seen this, this time where the coronavirus is affecting our lives. We live in a time where the old patriarchs, the Old Testament characters that we look up to, they wish they could have been around to see this time we live in right now. He said, how, how can you say that, Pastor? Because if you read Hebrews chapter 11, we call it the Faith Hall of Fame. And it starts listing out all these men and women from the Old Testament who did amazing things through faith. But when you get down to the end, it talks about folks that subdued kingdoms, who stopped the mouths of lions. But it then goes on to say all of these did these things through faith, but none of them were around to see the actual promise. And it says God has something better in store for us. <laughs> Which means I want you to get this because no matter how bad you feel like your 2020 has gone, it is a blessing to be alive in this time. Come on. It's a blessing to be alive. Watch this. To be called sons and daughters of the Most High God. Come on. In the Old Testament, they were servants of God. In the Old Testament, they were able to come before God and serve Him. We get a chance to get up every day and we can call Him Abba Father. We don't just approach him as God. We call him daddy. We approach him as our father. We don't have to come to him tiptoeing, hoping that we didn't do anything to make him mad. We can come boldly to the throne of grace to receive grace and mercy to help in our time of need. We live in a time where we get a chance to see, I believe, the return of Jesus Christ. People have different opinions, but I believe everything that the Bible says is necessary for him to come back has already been fulfilled. I believe we're marking time in these last days. And the things that we see around us are just the things that show us the end approaching right before our eyes. We're those that are blessed. Why says to have Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. Oh, you didn't shout amen like you understood that. Uh, you realize that in the Old Testament, the presence of God was locked up in the tabernacle. The third part of the tabernacle called the Holy of Holies. And only one time a year could a high priest go behind that curtain after he's washed and cleansed himself. Because if he didn't have his life right, he'd walk into the presence of God, drop dead on the spot. And history records, or at least they believe, that they would have to tie a rope around his ankle to pull him out because nobody could go into the presence of God to get him. Yet you get up in the morning, come on, and you've got God living on the inside of you. I heard this person say one day, I can't wait till I get to heaven, because when I get to heaven, I'm going to go up to Moses, and I'm going to ask Moses, what was it like to hold out that rod and part the Red Sea? What was it like to have all those Jews going on dry land, and then God closing up the Red Sea? I don't believe that's going to happen. I believe when we get to heaven, even if you search Moses out, and you start asking him, what was it like to part the Red Sea and walk through on dry ground? I believe Moses is going to say, well, that was nice, but I got a question for you. What was it like to have God on the inside of you when you're driving to work? 
What was it like to have inside information where the Holy Spirit will move you and direct you and take you around obstacles and give you inside information that the world doesn't have? What was it like to get up every day and lift up your hands and worship God? What was it like to just open up your mouth and sing songs to heaven and the whole presence of God just falls into the room where you are? What was that like? I believe Moses and Abraham and David are going to want to know what was it like to live in a time where everybody's terrified about a virus. You're using wisdom, but you stand boldly knowing my God is well able to protect me. What was that like? John chapter 16, Jesus says something similar. He says, and in that day, you're going to ask me nothing. But most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he's going to give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. He says, ask and you will receive. Watch this. So that your joy may be full. Come on, it's the second time he's saying this. I want your joy to be full. He says, in that day, you'll ask me nothing. Somebody say, that day. That day. Come on, say it like you mean it. That day, that day. is this day. this day. Come on, say it again. Say, that day, that day. is this day. this day. Now, we've already talked about the day he's talking about. It's not Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's the day of salvation. In the dispensation of grace, the time we live in today, he says, you're not going to have to pray and ask me anything. But God loves you. You're not going to need a priest or a pastor or a mediator to talk to God on your behalf. You better come to God yourself. And whatever you ask in my name, in line with his will, he said he'll give it to you. And he's going to give it to you. Watch this. Because he wants your joy to be full. Come on, God. He's trying to tell us something, saints. He wants our joy to not be kind of full, not be sort of full. Because if our joy can be full, then our joy must be able to be half full. Right? Does that make sense? If our joy could be full, then our joy could probably be a quarter full or one-eighth full. But Jesus says, I don't want your joy to be partially full. I want your joy to be topped off. You know how when you go to the gas station and, and somebody's giving you their, their, their gas card, you college students, especially here, go, go fill your car up. You swipe it and you start filling it up. How many know the first click, you don't stop? <laughs> Come on, you, you, you wait a minute, you click it again, then you start bumping the side of the car, right? Why? Because you want to make sure it's topped all the way off. Well, there's something that happens when our joy is topped off. When our joy starts to get low, just like the light in your car, the light in your car comes on to tell you, if you don't slow down soon and get some gas, you're going to be in a stuck place. Some of us, spiritually, your light has been on. You don't even realize it. Some of you came in here today, your light was on. That's why when Pastor Diana started ministering, just something came over you, man. I mean, it's almost like a, a dry ground and, and, and fresh water start pouring all over you. Life start coming back into you again. Why? Because you've been walking around with your joy light on. And you've just been trying to tough it out, trying to barrel through it. And what God is saying today, you can't just barrel through this. You can't just will yourself to not quit. you got to get your joy up because if you get your joy up, you'll get your strength up. If you get your strength up, then no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. But when that joy light gets low, you can tell symptoms of, a, of, of our joy being low is we begin, begin to get negative about everything. No matter how much good is going on around us, our mindset gets stuck on negative. When our joy light is low, we get easily discouraged. Our perspective is not clear. We get fatigued easily for no apparent reason. And we start to ruminate on all the wrong things. The word ruminate simply means to think deeply about something, like a, like a cow chewing cud. You know, when cows are grazing out in the field, they, they eat their, their grass, their food, they chew it up, they digest it, and it sits there for a while, then they regurgitate it back up, chew it some more, di digest it to another stomach that they have. They chew it some more, they digest it, they regurgitate it back up. That's what happens when we start to think about something good or bad for too long. We're ruminating. And if we ruminate on the wrong thing, it can put us in a place of depression. Can I tell you, there is a such thing as clinical depression where we do need to talk to a counselor or a psychologist, a therapist, might even need to be prescribed some medication to help balance off the chemicals in our body. But can I tell you, most of the things that we describe as, as depression, we simply need to stop thinking about the wrong stuff. Oh, yeah. I Isaiah 61 tells you that the anointing of God came upon Jesus to deal. He said, I've given you the garment of praise. For the spirit of heaviness. You know what? Depression is nothing but a spirit of heaviness. And these last seven months, you, you can be deeply spiritual and still battling depression. 
I know we don't like to say that at church because at church, when somebody asks how you I'm blessed and highly favored and empowered to prosper, I'm anointed to win. Because we know the church answer. I'm talking about how do we feel in the car before we come into church. I'm talking about how we feeling when we get in the car after church, got to drive away alone. I'm saying if we don't watch it, we can ruminate on the wrong stuff and it can take us to a bad place. I'm telling you not only what the Bible says, I'm telling you what I've experienced, man. I'm not talking about 30 years ago before I got saved. I'm talking about a couple years ago as the senior pastor, as the one they call Bishop Davis back at home, as the one who's leading thousands of people. Folks are cheering me on. I got to a place four years ago where we were going through a transition as a church. God was changing the direction and flow of our church to be similar to how your church is. This feels like home, man. Oh, my goodness. Anytime Pastor Sean got somewhere to go, tell him, send me. I'll come take over. i love to preach for you. This feels like home, man. Four years ago, we had bought a building in a mall, similar to what you've done. It's an amazing building. We bought a building in an existing mall. It used to be a belt department store. It was the anchor of the entire mall. It was a miraculous story. The news covered it and everything else. Everybody's up in arms like, wow, this church just stepped in and bought a mall. We had these amazing plans to come in, renovate the place right away. They, They did a story on it, and after we closed on it, it seemed like the bottom fell out of everything in our ministry. I mean, God was still blessing us and, 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 and using us, but I had about a third of my staff that just walked away from us because they didn't believe in the direction we were headed. And the bank that was once working with us was like, hang on a second, we need to push the pause, but we're not sure if this is a wise move now. And so here I have a 200,000 square foot building that has been announced and we're going to renovate it. And all the great things are going to come out of it. Part of my staff has walked away from me, and I am at a low spot. When you talk about your joy being stolen, I was robbed. I was walking around with no joy. 2017 was one of the worst years of my life, at least it felt like it. If there was ever a time I wanted to quit with all the success around me, it was 2017. My joy had been zapped, stolen. And in fact, one of our staff members, when they quit on their way out the door, they said these words, this church will never move into that building. And for four years, I had to drive past this building that we have now bought, that's now sitting vacant, that now became a, a, a burden, a sense of embarrassment for me. In fact, every time I drove past, it was hard for me to even turn and look in the direction because, watch this, I had no clue what I was going to do to finally get us in this building. One day in prayer, man, the Lord just spoke, gave a clear word, step by step, how to get it done. And can I, can I, can, 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 would you just shout and celebrate with me for a second? Can I just say that in 30 days, we will be moving into our brand new building? Come on, somebody. I said, come on, somebody. I'm just trying to encourage you. Just because they didn't believe in you doesn't mean that God stopped believing in you. Just because they said it couldn't be done doesn't mean that God says it can't be done. And you got to go ahead and stir yourself back up. Go ahead and grab your joy again. Go ahead and believe again. Go ahead and expect again. Go ahead and rejoice again. Because God never changes his mind. When he says yes, he doesn't care how many people have come behind him to say no. Come on, shout amen, somebody. Well, now, what does it look like when your joy tank is full? Well, you find the good and bad situations. You start to encourage yourself. Your vision gets clear again. You have unexplained energy. You find yourself smiling and laughing and dancing and running and jumping and shouting and crying for joy for no apparent reason. There's something that happens when our joy tank is full. Colossians chapter 1 says this, always thanking the Father because he has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us. One translation says he has delivered, past tense, us from the kingdom of darkness And he has transferred, past tense, into the kingdom of his dear son. We have already been delivered, and we have already been transferred into the kingdom of his dear son. Which means, watch this, even when we don't feel like it, we don't need to be delivered. Now, sometimes we need to find more freedom, but the freedom has already been purchased for us. And we've got to get to a place where we stop allowing ourselves, even if you're in the middle of a struggle right now. Maybe there's an area of your life where you're not experiencing the kind of freedom that you know you should. And it's become an embarrassment to you. You're tired of struggling in this same area. You're embarrassed to even tell your good friend in confidence where your struggle is. And the enemy will use that to try to heap condemnation on you. And God needs us to understand you've already been delivered from the power of darkness. 
Even if you don't feel like you've already been transferred over into the kingdom of his dear son. And when we have a brand new way that God is approaching us, we can't go back and keep using the old ways. Kind of like back in the day, man, when, 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 when they, we didn't have the you know, we had CDs and, and DVDs and MP3s like we have now. You know, back in the day, you know, see, see now if, if you want to put together a nice playlist, I mean, you, know, you can go through your Spotify, your Apple Music, and you just select a song, add it to my playlist. Which means if you and your bae want a slow jam list, come on, talk to me, somebody. All you got to do is click it. I want that. Mm, click it. I want that. Well, back in the day, huh, there was no click to add to your slow jam list. You had to get you a cassette tape. Now, I know some of you have no idea what a cassette tape is. Come on, you get your magic marker and you write on it, slow jams. You pop it into your radio. And you listen to the radio until you start hearing the beginning of a song you like. And you dash over there with two fingers and hit the button to start recording. And you could never come out of a song cleanly because the announcer would always kick in. This is WJCZ. <laughs> but that was your slow jam tape. Can you imagine today somebody showing up trying to create a slow jam tape? When somebody else is telling you, well, you know, all you got to do is add it to your playlist. Just add it to your playlist. I believe in heaven. God is saying, are you still trying to sit around and make yourself feel righteous? All you got to do is go to the well of grace and just add it to your playlist. Just allow me to remind you, you've been delivered from darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his son. Now, let me give you quickly five keys to maintaining your joy. This will help you. The, the, the first one is real simple, real practical. Just get around some joy-filled people. You say, where do I find them? Right here at Fellowship Church. <laughs> There's some churches you go to, you got some of the meanest people you've ever seen in your life. Those are not here. <laughs> Just get around some joy-filled people. I'm talking about the type of people that don't want to deal with drama. I'm talking about the kind of folks that aren't gossiping and talking about other folks. Get around some joy-filled people. Sometimes our joy gets zapped because we're hanging around people that won't let us experience a good day. They're always bringing something negative. They're always looking for ways to bring division. And it's amazing because the Bible speaks to everything we deal with. In, 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 in Titus chapter 3, verse 10, this is in the Bible. It says, warn a divisive person once. And then warn them a second time. After that, this is in the Bible, have nothing to do with them. What? That's in the Bible. You see somebody that's constantly causing division. Every time they come around you, they got the juicy gossip on somebody. They're always telling you the negative thing going on. The Bible says one and one time, like, hey, hey bro, I ain't going to keep, keep dealing with that. They come around again, trying again. The Bible says, hey, tell them, hey, hey dog, I told you last time. <laughs> Don't come at me with that. Then the Bible says after that, make a decision. Love them from a distance because you can't afford, watch this, for all that negativity to keep getting deposited into your spirit. You can't let your spirit become a garbage dump. Are there people around you who have faults in their life? Yes. But guess what? There's another person who has faults in their life. That's that man or woman in the mirror. We all have some issues. I got issues. You got issues. All God's children got some issues. We got to get to a place where we don't allow that negativity to get into us because it'll pull you down. It'll weigh you down. Second thing we got to do is get in a hurry to forgive other people. I, I said get in a hurry. Make it a priority. Not eventually I'm going get, to get over it. Not after a while, I'll be done dealing with it. Get in a hurry to forgive other people. Leave all the vengeance to God. When we choose to yield vengeance to God, God will prepare a table of celebration for us and give our enemies a front row seat. Let God handle it. That means get to the place where we refuse to give in to offense. I said this last night, I'll, I'll say it again. I believe with all my heart the reason why John the Baptist ended up getting his head cut off and being paraded around on a platter in front of all these people is because he let himself get stuck in offense. If I had more time, I'd, I'd go into it in depth. But the reason why John, I mean, think about it. Jesus said, of all the men born among women, there's never been anybody greater than John the Baptist. How does a guy like that end up getting his head cut off? How does a tragedy like that happen to somebody that Jesus said was that amazing? Because you do know God can deliver you even when you're right at the point of death. Remember when Peter was stuck in jail the next morning, they're getting ready to kill him, and God sends an angel in the middle of the night to wake him up, open up the gates, and he walks out free? 
If God can do that with Peter, come on, if God can do that with Paul and Silas when they're in jail, how is it that God cannot or did not deliver John the Baptist when he's in? It's the same kind of jail. So God can't get him out of that jail? Yes, he can. But when offense gets on us, and we won't get it off of us, offense can get us stuck where it will stop the power of God from doing what he wants to do on our behalf. You say, how do you know he was offended? Because John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins. Read the story. They're only six months apart. Both of them were born through miraculous circumstances. So you know both of their mothers, when they grew up, told them the story about how miraculously they were born. They had to be pretty close. No way in the world they're not close when they were both born with miraculous circumstances. When they're both adults now in the, for, for the flow of their ministry, John the Baptist is standing up one day. Jesus comes walking by, and John the Baptist says, Well, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In other words, I know who you are without a doubt. That wasn't enough he said it a second time. That wasn't enough he said it a third time. But then there came a day when John the Baptist got offended because he's in jail. And, and Jesus, God, is not moving as quickly as he wants him to move. So John the Baptist is in jail. Some of his guys come to visit him. He tells them, go in and ask Jesus this question. Are you the one that's supposed to come or should we be looking for somebody else? That sounds like offense talking to me. Are, are you the Messiah or, or is somebody else coming? And Jesus said, go tell John, watch this, again. <laughs> the, the deaf hear, the blind see, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Then he finished with this, and blessed is the guy who's not getting offended at me. Obviously, John the Baptist didn't listen. He stayed in offense, and I believe it opened up the door for the enemy to attack him in a way that was tragic. What am I saying? Let's just make a decision. I'm going to be filled with joy. I'm going to forgive people. Come on, if they did you wrong or if you just feel like they did you wrong, forgive them anyway. Even if they didn't ask you to forgive them, forgive them not because you feel like it. Forgive them because you understand I can't afford to hold on to this lack of forgiveness. Third thing, real simple, practical, get comfortable in your own skin. Stop comparing yourself to anybody else. You are amazing just like you are. If you're overweight, underweight, too short, too tall, you are amazing just like you are. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You don't need to be a carbon copy of anybody else. You may never sing like them. I wish I could sing like Pastor Sean, and now I wish I could sing like Diana. <laughs> it was bad enough he can sing. I knew he could sing. Did she come on stage and sing too? I wish I could sing. I wish I could preach like T.D. Jakes. I would tear this place up. <laughs> y'all have to call. Y'all have to call a construction company in here to repair this, the building after I'm done. I can't preach like T.D. Jakes. I would bust the vocal cord. I don't have the equipment. All I can do is give you what God uses George Davis to do. And when, watch this, when we get comfortable in our own skin, some of the pressure that comes from comparing ourselves to other people, it just goes away. Number four, real easy, get simple with your life. Simplify your life. That means you can't say yes to every opportunity. You can't do what everybody needs you to do. You can't run from pillar to post, burn the candle at all three ends. At some point, we got to slow down enough to realize if I'm going to have joy, I can't have joy when I'm fatigued and tired. i got to slow down. And then the last one is real simple. Just get a different perspective. Hmm? Perspective is how I'm seeing it. The, the angle I'm looking at it from. Get a different perspective. Sometimes what we need more than anything else is our perspective to change even before our circumstance changes. There's a story that somebody sent me some some years ago that I, I just love it because I think it's one of the greatest examples of changing our perspective. And it's this letter that this college student writes back to her mom and dad after she gets to college. I, I think you'll like it. She says, Mom and Dad, it's been three months now since I left for college. And I'm sorry for my thoughtlessness by not having written before. I want to bring you up to date, but before you read on, you better sit down, okay? She says, I'm getting along pretty well now. The skull fracture and the concussion that I got when I jumped out of my apartment window when it caught fire after my arrival here is pretty well healed. She says, I only spent two weeks in the hospital and now I can see almost normally and I only get these sick headaches once a day. She says, fortunately the fire and my jump were witnessed by Roger, the attendant at the gas station. And he was the one who called the fire department. He also visited me in the hospital and since I had nowhere to live, Roger was kind enough to invite me to share his apartment with him. He's a very fine man, and we're planning to get married. We haven't set the date yet, but it will be before my pregnancy begins to show. She says his divorce is final now, and he shares custody of his three children. 
The reason for the delay in our marriage is because Roger has gotten a minor infection which prevents us from passing our premarital blood test, and I carelessly caught it from him. This will soon clear up with the penicillin injections that I'm taking on a daily basis. She says, now that I have brought you up to date, I want to tell you that there was no fire. I did not have a concussion or a skull fracture. I was not in the hospital. I'm not pregnant. I'm not engaged. I do not have syphilis, and there is no divorced man in my life. However, I'm getting a D in art and an F in biology, and I wanted you to see these marks from the right perspective. <laughs> I mean, no, perspective matters. When you think that your world is falling apart, all you got to do is find somebody else because there's always somebody who would love to trade their set of problems for your set of problems. And when we get the right perspective, perspective brings it all into proper focus. I want to encourage you right now. I want to challenge you right now that God is the one who brought you here today. I, I'm not sure who invited you. Some of you, you're just not making it back to church for the first time after seven months. You might have even been a little bit disappointed when you walked in and your pastor wasn't here. I understand that. But can I tell you, you this was a divine setup today. God brought me from the east coast of the country to be the one standing here before you today because he needs you to understand you got to get your perspective right, man. You got to get your joy back. You got to fight to get your joy back. You got to dance when you don't feel like dancing. You got to praise God when you don't feel like praising him. Because if you get your joy back, you get your strength back. If you get your strength back, you can last long enough to see the goodness of the Lord. Because the, the, the truth of the matter is, the Bible says, don't be weary in your well-doing. Because in due season, you're going to reap if you don't give up and quit. The enemy's counting on you quitting. But can I just tell you something? He was counting on you quitting, but he didn't bank on you coming to Fellowship Church today. <laughs> Getting around all these wild, crazy believers who are not going to let you walk out of here and throw in the towel. Come on, lift up your hands wherever you are. Lift them up, lift them up, lift them up. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. You are the one who is the source of our life. You are the center of our joy. And even right here in this moment, Father, we take a moment to repent for letting our circumstance have that much power over us, for letting our perspective get so skewed. But instead, Lord, we choose right here, right now, we trust you. We trust you in the good times. We trust you in the challenging times. We trust you in this moment. And Father, even though we can't see how these circumstances are going to be worked out, we do know this much. You are with us every step of the way. And Father, 2020 has been challenging, tough for many of us. But we refuse to call it a bad year because you've been with us every step of the way. And if you made the entire earth in six days, surely in these last two months of this year, you can work a miracle on our behalf. We choose to believe that. We choose to trust you. We choose to walk in the power of your joy. In Jesus' name, amen.